welcome back. So, let us continue from where we left off. In the last lecture, I concluded the discussion on the mean variance portfolio theory, uh, which is uh, the cornerstone of contemporary portfolio management. However, if you look at the mean variance portfolio theory as in fact, the learners would have appreciated by now, uh, the calculations are quite cumbersome and uh, we now move on to the attempts that have been made in the literature towards simplifying the uh, optimization process and arriving at some kind of a situation where uh, we can implement it practically with lesser uh, problems, lesser difficulties. So, the first model that I am going to discuss is the single index model and then I will move on to the capital asset pricing model. Uh, finally, uh, I will take up the arbitrage pricing theory which is the uh, contemporary benchmark of modern portfolio theory. So, let us start with the single index model. Now, to appreciate the backdrop, the appreciate to appreciate the background in which this uh, single index model was propounded, uh, ha Harold Markowitz was uh, one of the founders of this model. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, Harold Mark Markowitz was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1990 for his mean variance portfolio optimization theory, the complete theory that we discussed in the uh, last uh, few lectures. Uh, and this is an extension of that in the sense that it is a simplification. It is uh, an attempt to uh, use that theory in a more practical environment. So, you see the problem arises why we need to look at simplification processes uh, is because if you are tracking n assets, n risky assets in your portfolio, then let us understand what are the inputs that we require uh, for formulation or for construction of the uh, optimal portfolio. First of all, we need n means or n expected returns uh, of all those n assets, n risky assets. Then we need n variances uh, for each and every one of the risky assets and then we need n into n minus 1 by 2 covariances between the various pairs of securities that are contained in those uh, n uh, risky assets or risky securities. So, we need to track a total of 2 n plus n into n minus 1 upon 2 parameters to uh, facilitate the optimization process. Uh, for example, if n is equal to 100, in other words, if we are tracking 100 securities, the number of parameters that we need to estimate as inputs to the portfolio optimization using the mean variance optimization framework that we have discussed uh, uh, is uh, totals to 4750. And if n is equal to 1000, we would need to track 501, 500 parameters, which is a gigantic amount. Uh, and uh, furthermore, the covariance, the tracking of covariances involve time series uh, analysis of uh, two securities at a time, which is even more cumbersome. So we, the uh, amateurs and the practitioners in fact, uh, who uh, were involved in the portfolio optimization practice or trade uh, attempted to simplify or attempted to find ways of simplifying the situation. The first model that was advocated was the single index model. Now, what is the backdrop of the single index model? Uh, casual observations of stock prices reveals that when the market goes up, market means market may be epitomized by a, a broad based index like we in India we have the uh, Nifty or we have the BSC, S&P, Sensex or uh, some similar index which is representative of the market. So, it, it is observed uh, in most cases that stock prices uh, when the market goes up tend to go up together with the market indices. And similarly, when the market goes down as represented, represented by the market indices, most of the stocks tend to go down in prices. So, this, this is the backdrop of the single index model that there is some intimacy, some relationship between the market indices and the stock prices of individual securities. And that forms the backdrop of the single index model. So, uh, the 
the inference that was drawn from this empirical behavior observed uh, uh, as far as pr prices of stocks are concerned or prices of securities are concerned that the one reason that security returns might be correlated is because of a common response to market changes. So, the interrelationship intercorrelations between securities may be due to their direct correlation or their direct association with a particular market index. So, when the market changes most uh, of the security change in tandem although of course, with different amplitudes, uh, uh, but they move in tangent uh, tandem with the or in the direction of movement of the market indices and therefore, they seem to be correlated among each other that is the perception that went into the uh, development of the single index model. The, and then the, uh, the, uh, the advocates of single index uh, propounded that a useful measure of this correlation might be obtained by regressing the return on a stock on the return on a stock market index. This is the backbone of the single index model this particular statement. Let me read it again. A useful measure of this correlation might be obtained by regressing the return on a stock on the return on a market index. So, that market index forms the independent variable and the return on the stock forms the dependent variable and if, if you run a regression between the two uh, with the mark, uh, return on the market index along the x axis and the return on uh, individual securities along the y axis that the uh, outcome would epitomize the single index model. So, now there is there is another issue that I need to highlight in this context. You see the return on a particular security uh, agreed it may relate to the market index. I accept the fact that it may relate to the market index, but it would pro, uh, not be totally explained by the market index. There would be some component of the return uh, on the security on an individual security which depends on several other industry or firm specific factors which may not be captured by the market index or the relationship between the security and the market index. Uh, and, but the problem would be that we may not have sufficient data either about the functional relationship between the, the uh, security uh, returns and these other factors which you, you may uh, identify as industry factors or firm specific factors. So, what do we do? We do the next best thing that because we do not have sufficient information either about the functional relationship or the data in the context of the uh, the exploration of this uh, uh, relationship between the uh, industry or firm specific factors and the and this uh, individual securities return. We model all these constituents into one term and we call this a random error term or a random term. So, the net result is wo of what I am say, trying to say the net takeaway of what I am trying to say is that uh, we can model the individual securities return into two components. We can separate it into two components. One is what emanates or what relates to uh, the market uh, variations or the variations in the market index, um, market variations as captured by the market index you may say and the other part which is independent of the market index and which we model as a random term which encapsulates all other singular features in relation to the security like the industry specific or firm specific factors about either, either about which we do not have much information about the functional relationship between those factors and the and the uh, uh, security returns or we do not have enough data to explore the any kind of functional relationship or uh, uh, we are not interested in, uh, in, in uh, you know uh, trying to follow up or trying to explore that relationship. In any case whatever the situation may be we model this composite factors uh, as a single term as a random term uh, which contributes to the uh, return on the individual security. So, that is in essence the philosophy of the single index model and let us now move on to the development of this model. As I mentioned uh, in the at the outset the single index model is a statistical regression based empirical model. I repeat there is no backdrop theory finance theory behind the single index model. In fact, uh, this is one aspect which differentiates the single index model from the CAPM model that we shall discuss uh, uh, after taking 
setting up this single index model after completing the single index model. So, the single index model is usually obtained by running a time series regression of the securities return on the returns of a broad based market index. This is the uh, philosophy of the single index model. Now, if you uh, let me explain certain terms uh, which would be uh, uh, which would be uh, taken up again and again during the course of this discussion. So, if you run an uh, ordinary least square regression uh, between the security return and the market returns, let us assume that you get uh, an, uh, a straight line uh, get represented by r, r hat i is equal to alpha i plus beta i r m. Now, uh, as you can see here, please note r hat is different from uh, uh, r hat i is different from r i. I will explain the difference in a minute, but uh, give this by virtue of this regression relationship that we identify by running a ordinary least square regression uh, is that given a value of r m, we can obtain a corresponding value of r i hat. Now, this is called this relationship which arises out of regression is called a systematic relationship between r m and r hat i or r i. So, the OLS regression equation depicts a systematic relationship between the uh, independent variable and the dependent variable. So, in other words you can explain the systematic relationship uh, as a relationship that exists between two variables. When the two variables move in a predicted manner, predicted may be by a regression equation. So, they move in a predicted manner, but they move in a predicted manner on the average. This on the average is again to be highlighted and emphasized. Why? Because it is not true that every uh, value of uh, uh, Ri that we get uh, in actual fact on actual uh, observation would be uh, contained or would be captured by this regression equation. Regression equation is the line of best fit as the learners would know. The regression equation is the line of best fit, there would, but the points that represent actual data need not necessarily at all lie on the regression line totally. Some points may be above the regression line, some points would be below the regression line, some points may lie on, on the regression line depending on the nature of data that we have available with us. But the point is that regression line is the line of best fit and that line of best fit because it is a straight line is captured by this regression, uh, regression equation R i cap. Now, R i cap is that point which corresponds to R m which lies on the regression line. R i is the point which is the actual value of the data, data point corresponding to a, a, a value of R m. So, there is a difference between them. Let me repeat R i cap or R i hat as the case may be, uh, it represents a point on the regression line which corresponds to R m. However, R i itself may be either above R i cap or R i it may be below R i cap, uh, dip, but that R i itself is a di actual data point which represents the value that the variable is taking uh, corresponding to the value of R m. Please note R i is a random variable because uh, it may take uh, uh, values which uh, are not predetermined, which are not uh, predictable and absoluteness. So, there would be difference between R i cap and R i that is important. So, the systematic relationship is a relationship between uh, between two variables which are captured by a regression line and therefore, which move in a predict as predicted by the re regression line, but that pre that relationship holds on the average. That means, if you have a number of observations between the two points and then the regression relationship would uh, the systematic relationship would tend to predict reasonably good results, but uh, any particular any single value uh, of the actual data may not lie on the regression line may not satisfy this relationship in its uh, absoluteness. Please note this point. Uh, this is very fundamental and uh, to repeat systematic relationship between two variables exists when there is some predictable relationship on the average not for each value. So, this is the uh, this this particular term shall be uh, a backbone in so far as this uh, single index model and this kappa model is concerned. Now, now 
extending on this systematic relationship rm itself is also a random variable the market returns are also a random variable you cannot predict with absolute certainty what the market return is going to be say two days from now or one day from now or even one hour from now so the important thing is that uh, the market returns themselves are random variables uh, now that means they obviously have a probability distribution and a expected return and a variance, but that is not important at the moment. The point is because of this randomness, this random nature of this independent variable R m, certain uh, randomness will percolate down to the value of R i. Uh, in other words, uh, a certain amount of randomness in R m will percolate to the uh, dependent variable which is R i that component of risk or that component of randomness and the corresponding risk that arises from the randomness or the risk of R m in R i is termed as systematic risk. Let me repeat this statement, it is very important. The uncertainty that percolates to the variable R i that is the individual securities returns due to the randomness or the uncertainty of R m is called systematic risk. This again is very important uh, in so far as these models are concerned. The uncertainty in R i that arises due to the cumulative effect of all other factors which we have modeled by the random term uh, is called unsystematic risk. So, again we are, uh, we are bifurcating risk into two parts, one part of the risk which arises or emanates from the randomness, the uncertainty, the risk uh, uh, embedded in the market returns and uh, uh, being observed in R i uh, uh, that is called and that is called systematic risk of R i and uh, the part which arises from other factors which we have modeled by a single random term uh, is called the unsystematic risk and uh, in the uh, security returns R i. So, let us now get down to the model in itself. The expected return under the single index model, the basic single index model equation simply breaks the return on a stock into two components as I mentioned just now, the part that is due to the market that can be identified as being associated with the market and the part that is independent of the market. Therefore, we can write R i as uh, A i plus beta i r m. Beta i r m is the part of the return which relates to the market and a, a i is the return that is generated by or that is independent uh, from the market and that is generated due to uh, other factors or other uh, terms that are not captured by r m. So, R m is the rate of return on the market index that is a random variable. Beta i is a constant that measures the expected change and expected please note this uh, word expected. I highlight or uh, emphasize this particular term we are not talking about actual return we are talking about expected returns. So, uh, beta i is a, const, uh, is a constant that measures the expected change in R i given a change in R m and A i is the component of securities returns uh, that is independent of the market performance which is again a random variable. So, both R m and A i are random variables both will have a certain probability distribution with means and variances. So, uh, this is the back this is the fundamental equation of the single index model. Now, let us talk about the development of this model. We write A i is equal to alpha i plus A i in other words we split this uh, uh, unsystematic return or uh, this, this return arising from the uh, random factors uh, industry specific or firm specific factors we split it up uh, into the mean uh, mean of this particular term and the dis distribution around that mean or the dispersion around that mean and we write it as a i is equal to alpha i plus e i where the expected value of A i is given by alpha i and uh, obviously, therefore, the expected value of E i would be 0 and we can write R i in this uh, with alpha i and E i embedded and in, incorporated therein in the form of equation 2 as R i is equal to alpha i plus beta i R m plus E i. 
now both now clearly the randomness that was there in AI is now being captured or is now being absorbed by the term EI and therefore, EI and RM continue to be random variables and each of them of course, as I mentioned has a probability distribution and a standard deviation. The jth realization uh, of uh, this particular uh, uh, equation will take the form that is given here R i j is equal to alpha i plus beta i R m j uh, plus E i j. Now, assumptions about this model, uh, uh, the uh, uh, simplistic version of, uh, of what the assumptions are, I have already explained. Let us get into the mathematical representation of those assumptions. The first assumption is that there is no correlation, there is no covariance between the term E i and the R m. That is the two random terms which, uh, uh, which uh, capture uh, the market risk and the non-market risk are independent of each other. They do not correlate with each other. This is the fundamental assumption, but uh, because we usually uh, develop this model through a regression process, this assumption need not be explicitly made. The very fact that we develop this model through regression, the process of regression itself uh, captures this assumption or makes this assumption formal into the, pro into the regression process itself. Uh, the to repeat the covariance between the unsystematic uh, relationship and the uh, and the systematic relationship that is the uh, the two variables e i and the vari uh, and uh, r m uh, are uh, is zero that is they are independent uh, of each other so uh, that is equation number 3 and uh, estimates of alpha and beta i, I have just mentioned this in fact estimates of alpha i beta i and sigma e i square are of often obtained from time series regression analysis. Regression analysis guarantees that E i and R m will be uncorrelated at least over the period to which the equation has been fit. The second assumption is explicit. We make this assumption because we need to simplify the uh, remaining part of the model. In other words, to make this model more tractable, to make this model fulfill the objective for which it is it is developed in the first place that is to simplify the optimization process we make this additional assumption what is this additional assumption the additional assumption is that the expected value of ei and ej is equal to 0 that means what that means that the only reason that the stocks vary together systematically is because of a common co movement with the market that the any two stocks in the market do not have any internal or uh, have any direct functional relationship or as a result of which they move in tandem. They move in tandem only because of the relationship between stock I and the market and stock J and the market. Because both these stocks are uh, related systematically to the market, uh, it follows that they would be moving uh, together uh, in some sense and that means uh, that means what uh, that means that we can afford to on the basis of this assumption rather on the basis of this assumption that the stocks move together only because they are moving along with rm uh, we can make this assumption that e of expected value of ei ej will be zero so in other words what we are simply trying to say is there are no effects beyond the market that is industry effects that account for the co movement among securities. Stocks move together because they, they have a relationship with the market or the market index as represented by the market index. They do not move uh, together because of any direct uh, uh, relationships among themselves. That is the uh, underpinning of this particular uh, assumption. There is nothing in the no. This is another issue. There is nothing in the normal regression method that forces this to be true. Uh, in contrast to the uh, uh, former assumption, assumption number one, which re, which uh, uh, mandated that uh, the covariance between R M and e, uh, E I should be zero zero. That is, they should be uncorrelated, which is captured or which is a part of the regression assumptions. In fact, so if you are doing this process, if you are modeling this as a regression model 
then that part becomes automatically uh, satisfied or fulfilled. This particular assumption does not get automatically fulfilled because there is nothing in the reg normal regression process that forces this to be true. It is a simplifying assumption that represents an approximation to reality. Now, we work out the various parameters uh, uh, relating to the security and the portfolio uh, uh, on the basis of the single index model. As far as the expected return is concerned, it is quite straightforward. The expected return on the individual security can be written as uh, alpha i plus beta i into expected return on the market. I repeat, uh, because the, the uh, expected value of E i is 0, the expected value of the random error term is 0. Therefore, we directly obtain that expected return on the individual security is equal to alpha i plus beta i expected return on the market. This is equation number 5. As far as the variance of a single security is concerned, under the single index model, the derivation is given on the slide. It is again a straightforward derivation. Uh, the sigma i square is given by expected value of r i minus r i bar whole square. When you substitute the value of uh, r i and r i bar, r i bar we have just calculated that is equal to alpha i plus beta i r m bar and uh, r i is equal to alpha i plus beta i r m plus e i. So, when you substitute these values and you do a bit of simplification, the outcome that we arrive at is sigma i square is equal to beta i square sigma m square plus sigma e i square, uh, where uh, sigma m square is the market variance and sigma e i square is the is the variance of the random error term. Let me repeat, now the, you can clearly see that the total risk of the security has been split up into two orthogonal components. Uh, the first component that is related to the market which is captured by the first term beta i square sigma m square and the second term which is independent of the market will, uh, which arises from the uh, other singular factors which we have not considered uh, or which uh, are not an ingrained in the market and which we represent as the variance of the random error term. So, the, just like the expected return, uh, we have the variance split up into two parts. The expected return had a unique part alpha i and a market related part beta i r m. Similarly, the variance has the part the unique risk sigma e i square and the market related risk beta i square sigma m square. So, again both the risk and returns are being split up into two components, a component which is related to the market which is associated with the market and a component which is independent of the market which is representing the random uh, singular factors to which the return on the security relates. Now, the covariance of securities uh, as you can see here in this, uh, uh, in this uh, um, slide again is the derivation is quite simple. Here you have to take keep track of one more particular point that I would like to highlight in this derivation and that is that the expected value of E i E j is 0. Please note that this is assumption number 2 of the model that the uh, any two securities show a co movement only because of their common relationship with the market. They do not have any direct relationship between them and therefore, the expected value of E i E j is equal to 0. And if you use this value, what we end up with is that the covariance between security i and security j is given by beta i beta j sigma m square. I repeat the covariance between security i and security j is given by beta i beta j sigma m square. So, the covariance depends only on the market risk in this model as uh, in this, uh, this equation or this expression for the covariance clearly uh, justifies our argument that the securities move because of their relationship with the market index and they do not have any direct relationships between themselves. So, uh, because the covariance and the covariance term does not contain anything about the individual securities, it contains only the market variance. 
Thus, the single index model implies that the only reason securities move together is a common response to market movements. The expected return of portfolio, this is quite straightforward. I will not devote time to this. Uh, this is a replication of the process or the position as far as individual security is concerned. The expected return on a portfolio e, uh, e r p or r p bar is equal to alpha p plus beta p r m bar, where alpha p is the weighted average of the alphas of the constituent securities of the portfolios and beta p is the weighted average betas of the uh, constituent securities of the portfolio. The variance of a portfolio, well again we uh, have a expression which is absolutely akin to the expression that we have for an individual security, although the derivation is a little bit more involved. Uh, we start with the uh, standard expression for the uh, for the variance of a portfolio of sec n securities uh, using the mean and the using these variance and the covariance matrix and then on simplification on introducing the expression for the total risk of uh, or the variance of an individual security given by this expression which I have underlined uh, and sim further simplification we end up with the expression that is given uh, in equation number 9. Beta p square sigma m square this is the systematic risk and summation sig x i square sigma e i square this is the unsystematic risk. Let me repeat beta p square sigma m square represents the systematic risk of the portfolio and summation of x i square sigma e i square represents the unsystematic risk of the portfolio. Thus, the total variance of the portfolio is again orthogonally divided into two parts. One part the systematic part or arising from the market totally from the market which is captured by the first term and the second part arising from the singular random uh, uh, variable or the singular term which it captures the other factors. So, I repeat the total variance is split up into two orthogonal parts beta p square sigma m square which represents the uh, randomness arising out of the market randomness and the other term arising from intrinsic randomness of the security. Now, let it, I just mentioned that uh, beta p square sigma m square represents the system systematic risk and the other term sigma x i square sigma e i square uh, represents the unsystematic risk. Let us explore that this a little bit more. Let us assume we know that the variance of an n security portfolio is given by this expression here on the slide. Let us assume that we have a portfolio which is equally weighted in all security in money amounts. I repeat, uh, we will uh, we'll start with the formula for the variance of uh, uh, NN security portfolio which is given by the first equation on the slide and then we assume that this portfolio that we are considering consists of equal weights of each of the constituent securities. So, for all the securities are equally constituted, equally included in terms of money values, in terms of money values uh, in the given portfolio. So, the weight of each security will be given by 1 upon n, because there are n securities and let us assume that uh, the weight and the total value of investment is 1 unit. So, the amount of investment in each security will be equal to 1 upon n. So, then we if we substitute x 1 equal to x 2 equal to x 3 uh, for all x's we substitute 1 upon n we arrive at the second equation on this slide. Now, the second equation that was there on the previous slide can be written in this form that is here as the first equation. Uh, in the first term we have taken 1 upon n outside and we have written the uh, first term that represents the intrinsic uh, variance of the securities uh, divided by n and the second term relates to the covariances. Now, if you look carefully, uh, let us analyze the first term first. Uh, the first term in the numerator contains sigma of uh, summation of uh, sigma i squares. In other words, it is the sum of the variances of all the securities, sum of the variances of all the securities and it is being divided by the number of securities. So, in some sense you can take it as the average variance of the 
uh, of the portfolio or average variance or the variance per security or the average variance per security of the portfolio and that is the first term. Now, if you look at the second term, the second term in the numerator contains the summation of all covariances. Please note given uh, n securities, the number of covariances are n into n minus 1, although the number of unique covariance will be n into n minus 1 upon 2, because sigma i j is equal to sigma j i for any pair of securities. But the total number of um, covariances which include non distinct covariances will be equal to n into n minus 1. So, the up the numerator in this term represents the sum of all the covariances and the denominator represents the number of covariances. So, we are dividing the sum of all covariances by the number of covariances and what we get therefore, is in some sense the average covariance. So, the first term really gives us the average variance per security and the second term gives us the average covariance. Now, let us look at how the situation develops when we increase the number of securities in the portfolio. Uh, if we take the limit of this expression sigma p square in the form that we have written it in the first equation, as n tends to infinity, what we get is we get limit n tending to infinity sigma p square is equal to sigma bar j k. That is the first term will, will disappear, will tend to 0, because of the pre factor of 1 upon n. Uh, as n tends to infinity, the pre factor will tend to 0 and therefore, the first term will vanish. Well, about the second term, if you look carefully, uh, n minus 1 upon n the, in the limit that n tends to infinity is equal to 1 and therefore, the second term does not vanish. The second term re remains uh, intact when uh, even in the situation where n tends to infinity. So, uh, the net outcome is that even after infinite diversification, uh, we have a situation where one of the components of risk, the component of risk that arises from the variances does disappear, the component of the risk that arises from mutual covariances does not disappear and the part that disappears is called diversifiable risk or uh, unsystematic risk and the part that does not disappear which arises from mutual co correlations or mutual interactions uh, is the part that does not disappear and it is called undiversifiable risk or systematic risk. So, the outcome of this particular uh, uh, exposition is, is, uh, uh, is summarized in this slide. Let us read through it there is some part of the total risk of a portfolio that can be diversified away uh, at the first component, the first part of the equation, the first term of the equation. The component of the risk, this component of the risk arises from the intrinsic variances of individual securities. This is the uh, uh, unsystematic risk, it arises from the individual variances of the securities. And the component of risk that is non diversifiable, that is systematic risk arises from mutual correlations between the securities. So, we shall continue from here after the break. Thank you.